Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sean Halifax, the Executive Director at Woodlawn and Pope Leahy House, sites of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this presentation titled African American Needlework in the Colonial and Antebellum South. This is just a reminder that the program is being recorded. If you have any questions during the presentation, please hold on to them. You can leave them in the comment section to the right of your screen, and we will address those at the end of the presentation. This is the first program of the 59th annual Needle Work Show at Woodlawn, which runs the rest of the month of March. We'll have an online version of the Needle Work Show available in April for those of you who are unable to join us on site in person. This year, the theme of the Needle Work Show is common threads, connecting people, families, and communities past and present. One of my goals for Woodlawn is to uplift the threads of history that connect us. These threads are of all kinds and colors. Some are tragic and some are heroic. Some are ugly and some are beautiful. Connected into various patterns, these create a sort of reflection. Sometimes we like what we see and other times we don't. However, it's who we are. It sometimes takes a certain amount of bravery to open one's eyes to it. But when we do, and when we contemplate what it means, we are better people for it. We are more connected than ever before. It can heal us, strengthen our relationships with one another, and unite our communities. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Kathy Staples. Kathy is an independent scholar living in Greenville, South Carolina. She's well known to students and enthusiasts of historic European and American needlework. Ms. Staples' curatorial experience includes exhibitions at the Textile Museum, now the George Washington University Museum and the Textile Museum, Colonial Williamsburg, the Charleston Museum, Georgia Museum of Art, and the New Bedford Whaling Museum. She has authored articles for numerous magazines, including the Journal of Early Southern Decorative Arts and the magazine Antiques. Her contributions also may be found in British Embroidery, Curious Works from the 17th Century, Twixt Art and Nature, English Embroidery from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, 1580 to 1700, Clothing Through American History, the British Colonial Era, and Georgia's Girlhood Embroidery, crowned with glory and Im immortality. Kathy, we're so honored to have you with us this afternoon from my home state, South Carolina. And with that, I'll hand things over to you. Well, thank you, Sean. I'm really glad to be with all of you via the virtual um, realm here. And uh, this afternoon, my talk is going to center on African Americans and um, those of, uh, women of African descent. Uh, it, uh, just a note that um, I'm very sensitive, um, as I know all of you are, to using um, um, uh, being sensitive to language. And so I will be using the word Negro every once in a while in this lecture, but it's only because I'm quoting something that was written either in the 18th or the early 19th centuries. And when I do that, I will be sure to let you know that this is a word that's in quotes. Otherwise, I would not be using that word at all. The one subject that's essential to any discussion of needlework in the context of the American South is the contributions of enslaved and free Africans and those of African descent, both as students and as a workforce. In this presentation, I'm gonna argue that the acquisition of needlework skills by enslaved and free blacks in the colonial and antebellum period, periods was not simply a process of teaching traditional European needlework techniques to females unfamiliar with a needle and thread. On the contrary, many Africans came to America knowing not only how to weave, but also how to produce complex embroidery patterns. The richest evidence for needlework activities in America is found in documents detailing the activities of enslaved females in Charleston and the South and the South Low Country, and the surviving embroideries of and records for free African Americans in Baltimore. And we're going to start with Charleston and the Low Country. In order to fully understand 
the place of needlework in the lives of enslaved Blacks in the Low Country. It's important to look at where in Africa these people came from. Scholars who have studied the regional and ethnic origins, back one, ethnic origins of African arrivals to the Carolinas have noted that low country planters had preferences, often differentiating among the many West and Central African cultures. Carolina planters deliberately sought out slaves of particular ethnicities or from particular regions based on the skill sets, physical appearances, and that would include um, country marks or tribal scarification and habits that they ascribed to particular African cultures. Although some of their characterizations were based on shallow and inaccurate stereotypes, their judgments sometimes reflected a calculated understanding of African cultures and economies. The most well-known of these preferences was the recognition that enslaved West Africans from rice growing regions brought key skills and experiences to Carolina rice cultivation and processing, including wetland planting methods and the use of fanner baskets. And I'll need to go back here. And I want you to look at, there's all of these little um, triangles here in this map of, this would be West Africa, um, the, the bump of Africa is here and it's coming down in here. And so all of these little places are where wet farming of rice had been going on um, prior to Africans arriving in uh, America. But this is also the general area from which most Africans were enslaved um, coming into especially the port at Charleston. And here we see fanner baskets. Fanner baskets are um, indigenous to these rice growing areas here in um, West Africa. And so that knowledge was brought over to um, the low country. According to the Charleston planter, Henry Lawrence, South Carolina planters preferred to purchase Africans from the Senegambia region. And that's gonna be right up in here. And that's also right big rice production um, area. And by the end of the colonial period, almost 20% of African arrivals were from that rice growing area. But not only geography, but religion played a great part in the rapid establishment of a skilled and slave um, black workforce in the low country. Centuries before Africans were forced to colonial America, Islam had made its way to West Africa from Egypt and Northern Africa through these caravan trade routes, um, um, also from the Eastern part of Northern Africa coming on down into what is Mali, into what is now Nigeria. And the two big cities um, that we would be looking at here are Timbuktu and Dijonne. Uh, these are major cities, very cosmopolitan. This is in the area well before where we have, um, we have uh, contact with Europe. Um, but Islamic traditions were brought into this area. Um, through traders, merchants, scholars, and religious leaders. Through time, the Islamic belief system blended with traditional West African practices to establish a faith that was specific to the region. In, idea, in addition to ideas, Islamic merchants and their caravans brought via the Sahara salt, horses, and books to trade for gold, ivory, and slaves. Textiles and needlework techniques counted as well as surface were also introduced from Northern Africa and especially Syria, which is gonna be up in here and Egypt. Think um, for those of you who've um, either heard me lecture about very early um, uh, double running and reversible techniques. This, all of this um, started out in Egypt and then Syria. And those techniques and traditions made their way along with ideas and goods to West Africa. In addition, West Africa was already home to a number of deep seated weaving and dyeing traditions, such as silk tombe tune wrappers and cotton 
uh, Bugolan Fini of the Dugon people of Mali, that's the empire of Mali right here, and then down into Nigeria. Um, and the embroidered men's tunics called Riga made by the Hausa men in the area of present day Nigeria. All of this suggests that at least some enslaved low country individuals were skilled in needle and or needlework production before they arrived in America. Although there's currently no documented Charleston, South Carolina sampler or good girlhood embroidery associated with enslaved or free black makers, documents such as newspaper advertisements and diaries attest to the formal acquisition of female of Western needlework skills by black girls and young women. From 1732 in its inaugural issue until the beginning of the American Revolution, South Carolina Gazette included notices for enslaved females for sale or hire that mentioned needlework skills. For example, in 1734, to be sold at public sale, quote, a Negro girl who can work very well with a needle. In 1745, quote, to be hired out a home-born Negro girl, that means she was born in the colonies rather than in West Africa, about 13 or 14 years of age who has been for some years past kept employed at her needle and in 1749, quote, to be sold at auction, Patty, a young girl bred to needlework and to wait on her mistress. Perhaps some of these skilled blacks had knowledge of African needlework techniques and adapted them to suit Western tastes. One might conclude that these enslaved were trained by their mistresses, yet contemporary documents such as the notices here on the screen offer evidence of alternatives. The apprentice system, and the same informal and formal schools of which the daughters of white citizens took advantage. In some cases, it's clear that an apprentice student was enslaved, not free, and her owner paid her school fees. Consider the following examples from Charleston, all of which reflect the level of artisan specialization that some enslaved women achieved. On May 12, 1747, merchant and factor Robert Pringle recorded in his letter book, quote, this day I agreed with Mrs. Smith at White Point and she ran a very um, fashionable boarding school for white girls. To take my Negro girl Peggy to lodge, board and instruct her one whole year in sewing, etc., for 20 pounds currency. He is paying her, he is paying the teacher this amount of money for a whole year's worth of instruction. Such an arrangement might have been considered either a short apprenticeship program or a year's worth of specialized education, but either in either case at a very respected, respected school in the city. In 1769, an anonymous master announced, quote, to be sold, the owner having no employment for them, a family of Negroes. The girl has been to school some time to learn to sew. And in 1777, for private sale, quote, a very likely young house wench, this country born about 22 years of age, who is as complete a washer and ironer as any in this state, and is likewise a good seamstress, having been taught her needle at school for three years. The owner sells her for no fault, but as being too valuable for the field. The fact that some white school mistresses advertised that they would accept only white children into their care strongly suggests that other teachers were willing to instruct Africans and African Americans along with whites. In most cases, however, the legal status of these black girls is uncertain. Were they enslaved or were they free? Anna Maria Hoyland, whose teaching career spanned over 50 years, first advertised her day school in 1751. She was, quote, obliged to all who will favor her with their children, which shall be carefully instructed in working, reading, etc. Two months later, she ran her notice, but with the following caveat. She continues her school carefully to teach white children reading or sewing. The implication here is that is perhaps that um, a mistress of a household wanted to send her enslaved servant to school with Mrs. Hoyland. In the next decade, similarly, Ann Cox advertised her mantua making business as well as teaching children to read, sew, mark, and Irish stitch. She takes none but white children. But other teachers often integrated or segregated instruction. In 
In 1762, Anne Hampton was greatly obliged to those who were pleased to favor her with the care of their children or servants, and read here, enslaved for the word servant. After the American Revolution, Mary Connolly advertised her day school where students will be taught to read, spell, needlework, and, quote, a few Negro girls will also be taught at the same price, one shilling a week, plain needlework and marking. And in March of 1803, Mademoiselle Emilie announced that she teaches young misses of color every kind of embroidery at her house from 9 to 12 o'clock a.m. And she may have been the Emily Belaton listed in the 1802 Charleston Directory. Surviving Southern slave-made needlework, primarily quilted objects, dates to the 19th century. Gladys Marie Fry, whose book Stitched from the Soul is a classic work on African-American textiles, has noted that enslaved women made quilts for the mistress and her family, as well as those for personal use. A number of quilts from this first group has survived. Family, family tradition maintains that the elegantly designed stitched and stuffed work dressing cover shown here was executed by one or more household slaves on a low country plantation about 1815. The top and the lining of the cover are cotton and the design outlines were worked in backstitch. Johanna Davis constructed this broidery purse quilted bed cover sometime between 1845 and 1853 when her first child, Susan Davis, was born. She was in her early teens at the time, but already a skilled mantua maker and dressmaker. She may have been a free black artisan rather than a slave and possibly made this quilt for a client. And as many of you know, broidery pierce is the applique of printed chintz motifs that have been cut from a whole cloth um, to make different kinds of patterns in its design. And of course, this selective cutting makes extravagant rather than economical use of fabric. So um, Johanna Davis may have made this as a commission for someone so that the um, uh, woman who her to make it provided all the materials. It's also important to note here that it's likely that the majority of quilts produced in South Carolina during the antebellum period and attributed to white makers display stitches worked by unknown black hands. And this would be especially true when it got to, if there's piecing to be done, um, that is generally um, assumed to have been done by uh, white females. But once you get to the putting together and actual quilting of, um, of these objects, um, then uh, and in a very skilled and slaved household uh, seamstress would have stepped in. Although the number of identified quilts made for personal use of a slave and her family is regrettably quite small, the reminiscences of former slaves recorded by the WPA and other educational groups in the 20th century testify to their construction. Slaves use material left over from their plantation clothing allowance, worn cast off clothing, and sacking fabrics and supplementing these with purchased textiles. For example, a Georgia slave recalled, and this is paraphrasing, grandma brought her feather bed with her from Virginia and she used to piece up a heap of quilts out of our old clothes and any kind of scraps she could get a hold of. Louise Evans, a former slave from South Carolina, remembered that she, quote, used to wait on the girl who did the weaving. And when she took the cloth off the loom, she done give me the thrums, when the thrums are the ends of the fabric on the loom, so that then Louise could make something else or use those uh, in part for patchwork. A North Carolina ex-slave expressed the danger, however, that quilting into the night in slave quarters could bring. My mama, she worked the field all day and piece and quilt all night. Then she had to spin enough thread to make four cuts for the white folks every night. Why, sometime I never go to bed, have to hold the light for her to see by. She had to piece quilts for the white folks too. Why, there's a scar on my arm yet where my brother let the pine drip on me. Rich pine, which is pine tar, was all the light we ever had. My brother was holding the pine so I could help mama tack the quilt and he go to sleep and he let it drop. Beginning in the 1790s, 
Charleston warmly received a number of refugees from the slave revolt in Saint-Domingue, now known as Haiti. And that is right down in here. Among them were women who established secular schools in the city and constructed African-Americans as well as whites. A contemporary source, report, source reported that many of the refugees were, quote, gently born, bred, accomplished, and elegant. Many of them became teachers, musicians, singers, art, actors, or artists. By their presence and tuition, the more graceful arts became much more widely known than to the rich only. This commentator reckoned that the most important girls schools in Charleston for most of the antebellum period were taught by ladies from San Domingo. And here you see this map shows you um, some of these refugees fled to New Orleans, others to South Carolina, others to um, uh, the um, tip of Virginia and a large portion of them up into Baltimore. Among the first teachers from Saint-Domingue was a widow, Mar you know, whose um, ad you see here on the, on the screen. And her husband had taught, her late husband had taught in Charleston as well. And as seen in this advertisement, in 1801, she offered French embroidery and lace work to the daughters of her white patrons and taught reading, writing, and sewing and embroidery to girls, uh, young girls of color. And at least one San Domingan refugee held concurrent classes for girls and their personal servants, i.e. enslaved. And this reference is worth quoting in full. At the first of these schools run by a Carib Caribbean refugee, there was a peculiar class when the carefully conducted young lady took her books from her maid, i.e. her personal slave, and entered the house door, the maid entering by the gate proceeded to the servants hall. And while ces demoiselles were saying their verbs, reciting Racine or reading Telemaque, the maids were learning fine sewing, darning and marking, lace washing and, and manners, all taught by the Mademoiselle's good Creole maid, Annette. So we have concurrent lessons downstairs for the personal servants of these girls and upstairs then um, uh, embroidery um, and other things taught by a, uh, a white woman. Shown on the screen are several images from anne marsan Talvan's French boarding school in Charleston, now known as Swordgate House. It's still there, and if you visit Charleston, be sure that you uh, take a visit past it. You can't, it's a private home now, so you can't go inside. But it's now called the Swordgate House, and if most Charlestonians will be able to direct you to where this house is. It was probably the most respective establishment for girls in the antebellum low country. And it's possible that the boarders slaves were taught here as well because they did bring their household servants with them. Anne Marston had married Andrew Talvan. Both of them were emigres from Saint-Domingue. By 1816, she had established a lady school at 22 Broad Street. And for close to three decades, Charleston's elite considered Talvan's school the most prestigious. It was certainly the most expensive. Basic tuition was $500 per term. Special studies and outings were subject to additional charges. And among the alumni of Talvan's school were some of the most notable female figures in Antebellum, South Carolina, including Mary Boykin Mill, later Mary Chestnut, who was the Civil War diarist, and Harriet Horry Rutledge, later Harriet Ravenel, a Charleston historian, and she was the author of the first biography of Eliza Lucas Pinckney. It's quite a journey from Charleston, South Carolina to Baltimore, Maryland. Although both provinces ascribed to the culture of slavery, Baltimore supported a needlework education offered through church-connected schools to free African-American girls during the antebellum period. Why these schools were allowed to exist is a function of the balancing act that Maryland maintained in supporting a slave economy, while at the same time acknowledging the economic value of its free Black population. After, um, after 1820, Baltimore was actually referred to, quote, as the free Negro capital of America, at a time when the legal status of free Blacks was increasingly being called into question in other Southern states. Tolerance of free Blacks in Baltimore was by no means universal, and many whites sympathetic to abolition subscribed to the notion of inherent Black inferiority. But despite these prejudices, there was enough financial support in Baltimore's white as well as Black communities for the establishment and operation of two institutions for free girls, quote, of color. These were the Oblate Sisters of 
Providence School for Colored Girls and St. James First African Pro Protestant Episcopal Church School. These two schools offered the daughters of unskilled laborers and domestic servants a curriculum that included sampler making. As the late Gloria Seaman Allen noted, these embroideries were equal in design and craftsmanship to the more widely known needlework produced by white, middle, and upper-class girls in Maryland. Because of South Carolina's strict slave clothes, clo slave codes, which also applied to free Blacks, these institutions in Baltimore would have been prohibited from operating in antebellum Charleston. And I really must add here that from now on when I'm talking about um, these um, two schools that I base my research on Gloria Allen's own. And so uh, she's owed a great debt um, for all to, um, uh, from all scholars who have used her work um, to help understand um, African-American education, especially of women in uh, this period. And so we're talking about Baltimore right here. Longstanding religious tolerance and two foreign revolutions facilitated the establishment of the Sisters of Oblate in Baltimore. From its formation, the colony of Maryland was intended to be a refuge, refuge for English Catholics who suffered under the prejudice of the Protestant majority. In 1632, Charles I, the English king, British king, a Catholic sympathizer, granted Cecilius Calvert, Lord Baltimore, approximately 12 million acres of land to own and govern as a proprietary colony. In encouraging both Catholics and Protestants to emigrate, Baltimore planned to demonstrate that a policy of religious tolerance would foster harmonious relations between the two religious groups. In the 1700s, laws and prejudices continued to discourage the emigration of Catholics to many of the colonies. However, freedom in religious practices was still a hallmark of Maryland society. So in 1789, that city became the official seat of the first American diocese of the Roman Catholic Church. Just two years later, Catholics fleeing the French Revolution found Baltimore a safe haven. And among these immigrants were Sulpician priests who, upon settling, established a seminary for the education of young men to the priesthood. Beginning in 1793, the population of Baltimore's Catholic community swelled again with the arrival of Black, mulatto, and white refugees who had escaped the revolt in Saint-Domingue. Same thing that happened in Charleston. And these were, quote, the cream of the French colon colonials in culture, wealth, and ability, as well as the artisans and slaves, people of all shades of color, from the Black born in Africa to the Paris born white noble of France, end quote. The French and Saint Domingue exiles were naturally drawing to each other through a common language, culture, and religion. So sometime after 1796, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Clarice Long and Mary Magdalene Ballet. Caribbean exiles of African descent began offering instruction to children of Baltimore's Black community. community. And the Oblate School still exists, and all of their um, accounts and um, written records are still um, there, and you can make appointment to look at them. Oblate sources know that, that exiled Caribbean families lost no time in placing their children in Miss Lang's school. And you can see here at the upper left on the screen, filled with the children of the most intelligent families of Baltimore, as well as a very large number of the poorer class who had not the means of paying their tuition. Lang was forced to close her school in 1827 because of inadequate funding. Lang's plight became, came to the attention of the Sulpician priest, Father James Hector Joubert, who you can see at the upper right. And they approached him, she approached him with a proposal to conduct a school for the instruction of black children that would be different from the priest's Sunday religious instruction. So out of subsequent negotiations, the Oblate Sisters of Providence was formed with four charter members, Long and Balas, were joined by a Caribbean emigre, Rosine Bung, and Baltimore lady, native Almeid Dushima, who is here at the bottom of our, thing, um, their screen. And the Oblates set up a school for colored girls um, and that's what they called it, that accommodated both day and boarding students, Protestants as well as Catholics. 
The curriculum included academic and ornamental branches, as well as religious instruction, and some of the practical skills necessary to become, quote, mothers of families or household servants. And there you see some later um, images, uh, certainly um, after the Civil War of schools, these same uh, black schools in Baltimore. Between 1810 and about 1841, white girls worked a number of Baltimore samplers, now known as the Eyeglass Gate Group, under the guidance of several teachers. In general, these samplers feature a brick house flanked by a pair of trees and a grassy yard, enclosed by a fence constructed of iron palings set into a brick foundation. The entrance to the yard is a pair of iron gates attached to brick columns. The gates with the repeated oval design re rep resemble pairs of wire rim spectacles or eyeglasses. The three examples of this style are seen here worked from upper left to lower right, Matilda Wedge in 1810, Anne Barrier in 1820, and Anne Ashcom in 1832. So you can see that the style doesn't change very much over uh, basically uh, 20 years. Compare the previous trio then with this sampler, which an oblate student, Francis Bush, completed in 1830. The details of the architecture of the house, the fence, the eyeglass gate are all identical to the sampler that Ann Barrier finished in 1820. Francis signed her work, quote, Baltimore, February the 17th, 1830. Francis Bush, to her dear mother, worked in the School of Providence. So she actually made her sampler a presentation piece to her mother. Accounts from the early years of the Oblates reveal that Francis, Bu Francis Bush's mother, Susan Hill, was a laundress at the rear of South Charles Street in central Baltimore. Susan enrolled her daughter as a day scholar in July of 1829. She paid $8 in five installments, which kept Francis in school for four quarters from September of 1829 to early August of 1830. Another Oblate student, Mary Petz altered her sampler, com sampler composition by shifting the house to the right and filling in the left with a bucolic scene of a shepherd and shepherdess with a flock of sheep. She stitched, quote, Baltimore, December the 4th, 1831, Mary Petz to her dear parents, worked at the Oblate School in the 10th year of her age. Again, another presentation sampler. She was enrolled by an unidentified person as a day scholar in the Oblate School in May of 1830. Over time, $12 was paid for six academic quarters, placing Mary in school from the 1st of September, 1830, until early spring of 1832, and an additional 37 and a half cents covered the cost of her books. As you can see, the samplers worked at the Oblate School compare favorably to the products of more elite schools of the day. These samplers are especially important documents because they speak to how samplers were perceived in an antebellum society as definers in part of social standing. The oblates appropriated an elite embroidery style, perhaps to demonstrate the skill that African-American girls could achieve. Although there are no samplers known to have been made after 1831, the school continued to offer comprehensive instruction in needlework, several Berlin work pictures worked by the Ablate students are known from the 1840s and 1850s, and although they have no stylistic connection to the samplers worked by white schoolgirls school in the 1820s and 30s, they do follow the popular fashion of pictorial needlework produced in the United States and Western Europe during this period. And so in 1846, Rachel Ann Lee completed this pastoral intense stitch at the school. And another, um, in 1848, Mrs. C. Solomon enrolled her daughter as a boarding student for one quarter, and you can see Sarah's work here. She paid $18 for board and tuition in advance. Her daughter was probably the Sarah Solomon who worked this large canvas of the young St. John holding a lamb. Above the saint's head, Solomon stitched his name in German, so it sent uh, Johannes. And my guess is that's because the... Um, the Berlin work pattern from which this was taken um, also had the name in German. I don't understand why I can't get. Oblate students continued to work religious, secular, and patriotic themes 
long after needlework was eliminated from the curriculum of most schools. Although her embroidery does not survive, the account for Emma Brown's needlework activities as a boarding student is extant. And here you see a blow up from that page saying that the fee was taken from, this fee was taken from the 1853 to 54 account and indicates that her mother was charged for those embroidery lessons and framing the embroidery and ditto for framing a sampler. This is another sampler um, needlework picture work by Samaria Gaines in Baltimore, July 1859, uh, and she names the Sisters of Providence School. She first enrolled as a day scholar in 1858. She completed her composition just in time for an exhibition that was advertised in New York's Weekly Anglo-African. And, um, and the Oblate student's needlework was praised at the end of the year exhibition. She first enrolled as a day scholar in 1858 and school ledgers and annals document that her attendance from the summer of 1858 through the summer of the next year. She joined a student body of approximately 150 girls, 30 of whom were boarders. And she received a premium for good contact could conduct and her father paid her tuition at the rate of $1.50 per academic quarter. And another, um, Adele Lattimore, born in 1852, executed this in 1865, um, also at St. Benedict School in Baltimore, which is another school um, for um, that grew out of the Sisters of the Oblate. <clears throat> now, not all surviving African American samplers from Baltimore are the product of the Oblate Sisters schools and under in, in a Roman Catholic um, uh, sort of setting. In 1824, William Levington established a co-educational day and Sunday school in rented rooms in central Baltimore. A year later, the church at which he was ordained, an ordained deacon received a corner lot in the city, the gift of a white benefactor, James Bosley. Thus began St. James' first African Protestant Episcopal Church, and it was the first Episcopal Church for Blacks built in the South. It was completed in 1827, and Levington moved his school to the basement rooms in this new building. Despite the lack of surviving records, three samplers from this school are known. Um, and um, we can see this sampler by Francis Bush. This is indeed the same Francis Bush who attended the Oblate Sisters of Providence School, where she worked an eyeglass gate sampler. She left the Oblate School in 1830 and started at St. James by September of 1831. So, Maybe she really liked to do needlework. As this composition clearly demonstrates, Frances Bush was an accomplished embroiderer who had received excellent training in needlework from the Oblate Sisters. The most significant of St. James embroideries that are currently known is the composition that Levington himself worked at least a little bit of in 1832. Uh, it's currently thought that um, uh, William Levington only worked these the lettering that says worked by William of St. James and that perhaps other female scholars worked the rest of the um, of the basket of flowers and the borders. Um, his stitched inscription indicates the embroidery was intended as an expression of gratitude to the church, to the church's benefactor and that would have been to James Bosley. I'd like to conclude this lecture with a, um, a comparison with a Northern school that provided the daughters of enslaved and free blacks with an education that included needlework. And this is the New York African Free School. Founded in 1787, the school which eventually comprised seven separate schools throughout greater New York City. And here you can see, um, uh, one of the, it's not the original school, it burned down pretty quickly, but this first school at upper left um, is dated 1815. It was a one-story um, school. 
Eventually, the other schools, up to seven schools, were built. And at the bottom image, you see the African Free School number two. Um, and founded in 1787, the school, which eventually comprised seven separate schools, taught both girls and boys. Needlework instruction was not added to the curriculum until 1791. The sewing program was modeled closely on the curricula curriculum at the Quaker-run female association schools. Needlework instruction was suspended for a time and then resurrected by a Miss Lucy Turpin, whose own sampler you see here at right, and she had been educated at a female association school. And so what she's going to teach, and she'll probably use her own sampler as a model, is going to be a sampler that will look quite Quaker in some respects. We know of two samplers currently from um, any one of the seven New York African free school buildings. This um, sampler done in 1803 by Mary Emmiston, um, we don't know anything about her. Um, the style of her sampler does not display motifs, uh, motifs that are typical of Quaker work, except in a sort of general way, you might have seen things like this. Um, but it's possible that at the time in 1803, when um, Mary was doing her work, that the teacher um, what had not been um, educated at a um, female association school. However, Rosina Dizzery um, sampler is quite Quaker looking and actually looks quite a bit like in terms of structure, like uh, Lucy Turpin's sampler. Now, uh, Rose, um, Rosina uh, was born in 1805 and her, her parents who were, um, who were um, Noel and Mary Desiree, were likely enslaved at some point with them living in New York. But we do know that Rosina was a, um, a free Black uh, when she attended this school. And you can see she did this sampler when she was 15. We know that she worked this sampler under the tutelage of Miss Mary Lindcrum. And Lindcrum had also been educating at a female know. association school. So you can see the Quaker motifs here. The verse that um, Rosina used was um, excerpted from a French poem uh, translated as Self-Love and Truth Incompatible, which is published in 1779 in English. Rosina was uh, very fortunate that when she finished um, her education, she married a man whose name was Peter Van Dyke, a successful cook and caterer who was a prominent figure in New York City's Black community. And he shows up in other um, documents from the city. The couple became very wealthy and they left their son an inheritance of $120,000 in 1877. So I'd like to conclude. The presence of Africans and African Americans was not a marginal feature of needlework construction and production in the early South. The institution of slavery defined the structure of that education and supported its economy. But as the above de discussions demonstrate, both enslaved and free Blacks had some degree of agency. They in fact had a long history of embroidery and textile production in West India, when, excuse me, West Africa, from where the greatest majority of Africans who were taken to be enslaved in the Americas came from. And this suggests that the previous skill sets of some black females perhaps were prized and then augmented with instruction in Western needlework techniques. This is just a starting point for further investigations uh, along these lines. But I think in future that um, in terms of reading more documentary evidence um, for both sides of the Atlantic that we're going to be able to get at um, even um, more evidence of, of agency and efficacy within um, certainly the enslaved Black community in, um, in colonial America. And I thank you so much for listening to me this afternoon, and I'm happy to take on any questions that you have, um, and I hope I'm able to answer them.
Well, Kathy, thank you so much. We already have some questions. And one of the questions um, from Catherine is, um, the needleworks of Rachel Lee and Adel Adele Lattimore remind me of the small beaded pieces made in France. Do you think there is a connection? You bet. <laughs> I think that um, one of the things that hasn't been studied at all, and I think needs, um, needs exploration, is the exact nature of the folks who emigrated from Haiti. Now they're French. And I, I believe that, that at least from the Charleston material and what I've been able to read, that, um, that needlework was an activity that was practiced by enslaved as well as free blacks in Saint-Domingue. It certainly was um, appreciated and practiced in other Caribbean islands. Um, so there's, to me, there, um, there would be no question that, there's, um, that there is a link there. And it would be a great research project for someone to step up to the plate and do. Um, uh, but I think this is, um, this is an area that really could expand on Gloria Allen's writings. So that's a great question. Kathy, Sandy um, has a comment and a question that looks, or yeah, a comment and a question. Um, uh, she says, so wonderful the work with sheep. Were these based on motifs normal at the time or would they have been on farms in the area? I'm from Baltimore. I'm from the Baltimore area originally an animal scientist. So increased interest. Thank you. Okay, so we're talking about sheep on samplers. Is that how you interpret that question, Sean? That is. Um, okay. Yes, yes. Sandy says yes. Right. You'll see a whole lot more sheep on northern samplers than on southern samplers um, in general, and that is because there were more sheep up north than there were on in this in the south. Um, if you might remember from your history lessons that New England became a commercial center early on in colonial America, precisely because it didn't have farmland enough farmland that was suitable for growing big production crops like southern colonies um, eventually um, developed. So um, with little to trade to England, and those primarily are probably native um, uh, naval stores like pitch and pine and trees, as well as um, skins and furs, um, they actually became banking centers, but you do get sheep because sheep can deal with rocky climates and all of the rest of that. Um, there were sheep in, um, in colonial Charleston very early on in the colonial period before 1750. We do have, um, when there is a home production of textiles on plantations, they are spinning um, wool from sheep and using it along with um, linen uh, or flax, although there's not a lot of flax production down here. But um, sheep were very definitely um, a part of textile production throughout the colonies and especially into the back country. If we consider um, the um, western part of Virginia and then all of Pennsylvania, sheep important commodity, important um, not only for uh, meat, but also for production of those beautiful blankets that you see coming out of, uh, for example, a Mennonite tradition and down down into uh, what I call a Valley of Virginia tradition of very brightly colored uh, plaids and checks. Good question. Um, Kathy, I, when I moved to Charleston, uh, back in the late 90s, I was uh, very surprised to see, I was working at Middleton Place and I was very surprised to see all the sheep on the lawn, yep. keeping the lawn yep. mode at Middleton yep. Place. Um, and it was the dead of summer when I went there and I was sweating terribly and I couldn't imagine those poor sheep um, in that heat. Right. Um, another question is, can you explain what features and elements determine what a, determine whether a sampler was a Quaker sampler? 
Oh, um, if you look at the earliest um, of the Quaker samplers made in this country, they were made in England before they were made here. And in fact, the, the Quaker style actually um, developed directly from a style that was of sampler making that was being done in uh, Yorkshire, England at a Quaker school there. And in fact, a sampler from that school was brought over to this country so that they actually, so that teachers actually had something to go by. But uh, in general, um, Quaker samplers are, uh, especially those from the earlier, an earlier time period, are, uh, this would be, uh, by early, I mean the late 18th century, are um, characterized by um, a plainness. Uh, many samplers have just writing with a few little motifs like uh, two birds facing each other. Um, and they'll also have lots of, um, there may be geometric shapes, uh, octagons, half octagons, quarter octagons. Um, the color palette is, um, is limited and is more subdued in general. Um, and you get, um, as, as the style goes on, the Quaker samplers take on little sprigs of flowers um, and, um, well, I can back up and show, let's see. So you see these little sprigs of flowers here and these little tiny baskets of flowers. You'll also see baskets of flowers on non-Quaker samplers, but it's just, they're very, it's, uh, there is a delicacy to, um, I think, to Quaker work. Um, that, um, that you don't get in other sampler traditions. And then of course, going into the 19th century, there were non-Quakers who borrowed these elements because they were um, so appealing. Um, so that you can get some, a sort of lighter um, visual weight to samplers. I hope that kind of acts, um, gives you an understanding of that. Yeah, and Kathy, we'll have um, later on this month, if you're if people are able to join us in person here at the show, um, and actually now on display, we have some reproductions of Quaker samplers, several okay. reproductions of Quaker samplers on, on display. Mm -hmm. um, and that'll be a part of a, another program that we're doing later on in the month. Joanna asked, um, do you think that the China silk routes had an influence on the needlework skills of women in Africa? Yep. Um, we do know from when I um, was studying um, the earliest embroideries that I have studied have that are not in an archaeological context. Well, yeah, these were. Uh, <laughs> they're coming from an archaeological context. Were um, embroideries and actually knitting that came out of archaeological sites in um, Egypt, um, and they were made during a period in which. Um, uh, which is called Mamluk Egypt. Um, Mamluks were soldier slaves in the previous regime who actually, because their masters let them do everything, they became very powerful um, warriors and then basically took over. The thing about Mamluk, the Mamluk time period is that the Mamluk governing elite was really only interested in um, consolidating land. And so they basically let um, the population um, do a whole lot more than they would have under um, a more um, Islamic regime. Egypt was Islamic, but there were Christians and Jews who lived there as well. And we're talking a period from um, maybe about 1140 until 1400, something like that. And so there was a rise in artistic use of, um, in ceramics and in calligraphy and in embroidery. That embroidery and that silk, those foundations actually came probably earlier via um, caravans uh, along what then became the Silk Route from China. Um, we know during the Han Dynasty, for example, that um, 
that there was uh, embroidery as well as textile production that made its way across from China through Northern Africa and end up in, um, in Rome and actually end up in further up into uh, Western Europe. So uh, yeah, China, I think is, I mean, we could call the, we could call China the cradle of needlework civilization if we wanted to, but I think that, yes, that, that if we were to look for the, those deep roots that um, China would be a good place to go. Um, Kathy, Helen Tribe says, greetings from Newcastle, England. And her question yeah. is, was the Yorkshire Quaker School Ackworth? Yes, Ackworth. Thank you for reminding me the name. <laughs> <laughs> um, Michelle Garrett uh, wants to know, well, she says, first, thank you for a wonderful hour. Do you know if any of the samplers you featured today have been reproduced for us to stitch? Whoa, good question. I know that Rosina Dizzery sampler which you see on the screen now. I know that that has been reproduced, but you would have to, I would have to, I guess you would have to contact the New York Historical Society, which is where this is, sampler is located. Um, I think for um, anyone interested in doing reproductions of these samplers or stitching, finding out if kits are available, your best bet um, would be to look at a, I think I, I put where these samplers are all from, um, but your best bet would be to contact the institution because all of this has to be licensed and they would know their, um, their licensing departments would know whether um, a particular sampler has been licensed for reproduction. Um, there's several people that are making some um, comments uh, about where some of these um, sam some of these reproductions are, uh, Barbara Hudson, who is out, who is his reproductions will have on dis have right. on display. Um, she has repro reproduced the pets and barrier samplers. Oh, great, great! Um, the eyeglass samplers also, and um, Rosina Misery is on Etsy. Disery oh. is on Etsy. Super. Um. So we are just about out of time. It's 4.59. I want to thank everyone. Um, Kathy, I don't know if you can see, there's lots of thank yous and comments in the, in the uh, comments uh, in the chat section. So please take a look at that. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. We have several more programs lined up for you to attend virtually. So if you found um, today's... Um, I'm sorry, I, I lost my place. I want to thank, um, so if you found today's uh, program value, valuable, please join us. They're listed on our website. Um, though they are free to you, they are not free to present. We appreciate those of you who have already donated to Woodlawn and Pope Leahy House and the, and the Needlework Show and encourage those of you who have not to please consider. In about 30 minutes, you'll receive an email that will include a link for a program survey and a second link to support us. Please take a few minutes to fill out that survey. I can't tell you how important that is. Um, it's very short and also please make a donation. Thank you and I hope you have a wonderful Saturday afternoon and please don't forget to spring forward tonight.